The Unshackled Waves, Episode 87. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have you company. As most of you are aware, I'm in New Zealand currently to cover that nation's general election, uh, but there is still news happening back in Australia and around the world. Uh, and Shackled contributor Jacob Watts will join us in a moment to dissect the latest news. But first, as we start each review show now, we will first tell you what is happening right now. Survey forms for the same-sex marriage plebiscite are now arriving in mailboxes throughout Australia. Uh, Meanwhile, the government passed emergency vilification laws to be enforced throughout the plebiscite, which is a brazen attack on free speech. Uh, You also saw the corporations ratcheted up their campaigning with Coke having special cans and subway receipts saying vote yes, to name a few examples. Another continuing policy crisis is that of affordable energy. The Turnbull government is trying to keep the Liddell coal-fired power station in the Hunter region open past 2022. Of course, renewable energy targets and subsidies by governments are the main contributor to the current crisis. But as we saw, the head of AGL, Andy Vizi, who he is determined to see his company exit the coal industry, uh, which demonstrates that the problem is also virtual signaling corporations with their corporate uh, social responsibility policies. Finally, we saw Australia get media reform after the government successfully negotiated their legislation through the Senate with the support of One Nation and Nick Xenophon. It sees the two out of three rule go as well as the reach rule. These are archaic laws uh, in the internet age and were only introduced by the Keating Labor government because they were paranoid that Murdoch and Packer would own everything and say things that they didn't like. The War in Australia Day continues with another inner city Melbourne Council, Moreland Council, voting to dump Australia Day. They had uh, previously rejected a similar motion earlier this year, uh, but now they thought they'd jump on the anti-Australia Day bandwagon. Furthermore, one socialist councillor, Sue Bolton, uh, made the outrageous comparison uh, saying celebrating Australia Day was like celebrating the Holocaust. Hillary Clinton has made an unwelcome return to public life to promote her new book, What Happened, which is her explanation about why she lost. No surprise, she blames everyone else but herself. She blames Bernie Sanders, the Russians, James Comey, and even the mainstream media. Of course, uh, she doesn't think that an unsecured email server was a big deal and doesn't comment on the WikiLeaks emails which exposed uh, how corrupt the Clinton Foundation was. The crisis in Myanmar involving the conflict between the Buddhist majority and the uh, Rohingya uh, Muslim minority continues. Uh, 300,000 Rohingyas have fled into neighbouring Bangladesh. The Greens want us to accept 20,000 Rohingya uh, refugees, uh, but the last thing our nation needs is more Muslim refugees. Australia should instead focus on efforts to keep them safe in Bangladesh, which should be noted as a Muslim majority country. There was yet another terrorist attack which occurred in the United Kingdom, again in London, with an explosion at a London tube station. 30 people injured, but thankfully there were no fatalities. Uh, The UK government should note that the Islamist problem isn't going away from their nation anytime soon. North Korea has launched another missile again over Hokkaido uh, in Japan, triggering their J-Alert system. Uh, North Korea, it seems, is not backing down and appears that uh, this crisis must come to a head uh, sooner or later with this uh, continuing deliberately provocative action from North Korea. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Jacob, welcome back to the show. Yeah, g'day, Tim. It's it's great to be back again and we've uh, got a big... Big, big news of, uh, big, big week of news to talk about here. Yeah, so, well, Australian news uh, specifically because uh, I'm in New Zealand and so my focus has been on New Zealand politics, but there's a, a lot being ha- happening uh, back in Australia. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, uh, what's been dominating again this week is the continuing uh, same-sex marriage uh, plebiscite. People have started to get their, their ballots in the, in the mail, but uh, what are the most recent developments on this front? 
Well, we have seen an, uh, essentially 18C on steroids being introduced by the Turnbull government. A uh, bill to curtail free speech has been passed through both houses and we're seeing a $12,600 fine for anyone who vilifies, intimidates or threatens anyone during the campaign. Uh, this legal action will have to be approved by the Attorney General Brandis first. Uh, we're also seeing um, a banner uh, being unveiled by a, a traditionalist nationalist front in Brisbane. Now, questions that we could be asking is, could this offend someone? Is this worthy of a $12,600 fine? We're seeing uh, big companies like Coke get behind uh, the gay marriage campaign. And we're also seeing lefty, um, uh, well, uh, uh, lefty, uh, Twitter personalities, uh, Benjamin Law, for instance, calling basically for the rape of people uh, who he disagrees with, um, and in particular talking about uh, uh, Mr. Hasty of the coalition. He said that he would like to uh, give him a try. Uh, I'm actually glad that I'm in New Zealand for two weeks because I'm just so sick of the the, the same-sex marriage debate and yeah I, I, I can't believe that you know we're supposed to be the, the whole purpose of this plebiscite is so that we can debate the issue yet the the government more was more than happy to pretty much without any opposition pass these anti-free speech laws I mean you know vi uh, vilification I mean that's that's very uh, subjective uh, you know, so, so is intimidate, um, threaten. Obviously, that's that's a bit more serious. But of course, uh, you know, all of these uh, ty types of words are, are subjective, and I, I think people are right in suspecting that these will probably target the the no campaign more than the yes campaign. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we've also seen. I bought a, a copy of the quarterly essay today, and. And Benjamin Law, who's, who said, I'm, I just have to read this quotation out for what it is. He said, sometimes find myself wondering if I'd like to hate F um, all the anti-gay MPs in Parliament if it meant they got homophobia out of their system. Now, you know, I'm all for people's free speech unless it's inciting violence, of course. And, and now I have to believe that Benjamin Law here uh, is inciting the rape of, of NPs who disagree with him uh, and that would certainly be worthy of the $12,600 fine because I think he's both vilifying, intimidating and threatening and it's all during the campaign as well. Uh, he's, uh, I've known who Benjamin Law is for a number of years. I mean, his Twitter feed, it's just full of, you know, vile abuse. Uh, 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 over the years, I mean, he's said, you know, disgusting things about, you know, to uh, Tony Abbott and, and other conservatives. Uh, and, and yet most everyone made the point that, you know, his quarterly essay was on, you know, safe schools, which is supposed to be, you know, anti-bullying, yet he dishes out abuse all the time. Yes, well, it's, it's the case of um, him not exactly following his own preaching. He's... Uh, certainly uh, not afraid to dish out vitriol on Twitter, not afraid to uh, abuse and belittle people, um, certainly doesn't shy away from the ad hominem attacks and definitely doesn't get to the substance of any debates. Name calling and threatening is his business and it's it's sad to see that this is where, um, where this debate's gotten to. And if you want to know a bit more about him, not only is you know he a, a gay activist, but he also well he's also uh, Asian as well, and he claims that uh, the Australian media is is too white that we're still a you know racist country. So you know he's he's not he's a gay Asian Australian, so he's one of the worst embodiments of our identity politics. Oh, I hate to break it to him, but. Uh, I believe that the last census shows that we are about 90% white. Now, I'm sure that there's probably an overrepresentation in the media of people who are Asian. Uh, I don't think it's an issue. And again, it goes to the issue of identity politics and why it's such a scourge. We should be focusing on meritocracy. If someone is good for the job, then they should get the job. Shouldn't be based on skin colour. Shouldn't be based on 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 filling out racial quotas, but 
I just have to get back again to his words because his words are very damning here. He said, uh, these, 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 sorry, apologies, these are from the words from ha um, MP Hasty, which is one of the uh, MPs that he threatened to hate F. He said, um, noting my skills acquiring, acquired in my previous service career, I'd like to see him try, said Hasty, a former SAS operative. Um, if anyone on the No campaign jokingly suggested using sex as a weapon against Yes campaigners, there'd be in, in immediate calls for their resignation, marginalisation. Instead, this word get this guy gets a twenty thousand word platform in the quarterly essay, um, and I think that that is disgusting. Uh, and of course, you know Benjamin Law with publishing this quarterly essay, uh, he is you know linked obviously you know same sex marriage to uh, safe schools, which is so he's he. In this essay, he uh, argues that it, you know, should be it should be compulsory, and that it's part of the, you know, LGBT agenda, and it, and he he's basically proving the the no campaigns reasoning right that you know if you introduce same sex marriage, then programs like safe schools will get worse. Where, you know, but there are a lot of people on the yes side are, are trying to say no, they're separate issues. So uh, Benjamin Law is actually you know hurting the yes case. It's funny you mentioned that, Tim. I bought it, the quarterly essay. I haven't read, um, haven't read it yet. But I bought it with the intent, with the direct purpose of, of reading his work. But he's basically giving an intellectual, um, he's give, basically giving an intellectualised case uh, from the yes side as to why Lyle Shelton's talking points of the Australian Christian Lobby are correct. He's basically digging his own grave. Uh, with with his words, um, yeah, and I think that that's interesting. And we also saw uh, this week as well a few a few other no campaigners being targeted. For example, uh, Israel Folau he put out a you know tweet saying which was you know very respectful, saying that you know he respected all all people, but you know he wouldn't be supporting it. And of course, he copped abuse from that. But uh, as I wrote in an article, the ironic thing was that he was an ambassador for a uh, gay rugby tournament back in. Uh, 2014, because uh, he wanted to, you know, stamp out uh, homophobia in rugby. Uh, yet, you know, because you know he is a, you know, Christian, he has a traditional view of marriage. That you know, suddenly he's, you know, on par with, you know, a gay basher. Well, it's sad to say, um, to see, sorry, rather, because he does not believe in bigotry. Uh, as you've noted before, and as, as you noted very well in your article, and to all people watching, I would recommend that you you watch, uh, uh, sorry, uh, read Tim's article on Israel Flau. But the the abuse that he's received for basically having a point of view that probably say forty percent of Australians have, maybe forty five have, is ridiculous. He has religious convictions. He stood up against um, homophobia and, and abuse, and he's and he's certainly um, a, a good and moral man. But you see attacks on people for having a commonly held opinion, uh, in some cases, are losing their job. Now, just look at what happened to Margaret Court. She recently got sacked uh, for having a traditional uh, view on marriage from the, the her local tennis club, I believe. So. Um, I don't think that people's religious convictions uh, should be getting them uh, sacked from the job if they're not interfering with their uh, ability to perform their tasks at work. And, and clearly, uh, Margaret's uh, ability was not affected by by her uh, moral and ethical position, uh, religious position that she has on marriage. Um, I just think that that's ludicrous, but certainly. Uh, Israel Flau is a, is a good man, he's a man of God and he uh, stands true to his convictions and he stands against bullying and I, I certainly don't think that he deserves all this abuse that he's received. So our political leaders are still talking about uh, energy, well uh, more specifically affordable energy and it seems there's all these you know, proposals being thrown thrown around, but you know, we're we're no closer. Power bills continue to rise, but uh, uh, what's been the, the the hot air this week? 
Well, Bill showed uh, urging Dan Andrews uh, to think again about locking up a gas reserve for uh, conventional exploration. Uh, he also urges Malcolm Turnbull uh, to take on further export controls. Uh, the Andrews government, of course, banned coal seam gas fracking and has put uh, a ban essentially on a conventional gas exploration until 2020, which is loopy, uh, completely crazy. Of course, this brings into the question, is it stifling innovation because of green dogma? Again, the uh, coalition's uh, renewable energies target is at 42% now, uh, which is considerably high, but not quite as high as Labor's at 50 uh, AGL wants to pull out their coal power plant in, in New South Wales, which endangers a power supply of 1.2 million. Um, and Bill Shorten attacks uh, Malcolm Turnbull's hypocritic, you know, hypocritical uh, nature. Um, and uh, Tony Burke describes him as a lawyer with a brief who uh, just says what people want him to say. So. Uh, a pretty interesting uh, and lively uh, week uh, for the energy debate. Well, I'm surprised that Bill Shorten actually offered a solution which was not half bad, which is why is there this ban on conventional gas exploration? I mean, of course energy prices are going to rise if it's illegal to you know, search for it. Well, well of course, um, and Victoria was hit very hard by the closure of Hazelwood and um, if the government isn't there to let us, let the free market, uh, come up with a solution which is gas to lower the power prices then I think there's going to be a lot of angry voters who are going to turn against them but I think that Bill Shorten is right here when he says that Dan Andrews needs to think again uh, because you know locking up uh, conventional gas reserves is completely crazy. Um, maybe the jury's still out on whether fracking is good or not. You know, I don't. I haven't seen any uh, empirical data to say that it isn't good, or can it has extreme detrimental effects. But certainly, I think that Bill Shorten has a point here. Um, but of course, if we if there wasn't a moratorium on general, uh, just uh, general uh, conventional exploration and fracking. But there wouldn't be any need for government intervention or export controls for that for that matter. So I think that the market uh, would be able to figure it out, would be able to deliver cheap price to consumers, but it seems that the government uh, seems to keep getting in the way uh, to pursue these uh, renewable energy targets. Well, another important point is that it's not just governments that are uh, you know, driving uh, this shift to renewables. It's also the uh, the, the corporate sector where they're you know uh, embracing you know these uh, you know renew renewable technologies because it's a, a good way for them to demonstrate you know corporate you know social responsibility. You mentioned uh, AGL. They've had those ads on the TV saying you know we're getting out of coal, and uh, a lot of the the big banks uh, won't uh, give out loans for for new coal projects, which is why the Turnbull government is now flirting with the idea of, uh, get, of government helping to set up a coal-fired power station. So, so it's also uh, there, there's also it, there's also the corporate sector that that's embraced this green dogma, uh, and uh, that's just exacerbated the government intervention already. Well, it's a worthy point you raise there. Um, I heard Bill, uh, sorry, David Leinhelm say that he's generally against government intervention within an economy. Uh, he said that government, you know, getting involved uh, with the economy is almost against my religion, being a libertarian. So that was a, a nice little tongue-in-cheek comment there, and I just thought that it was valid. We, we do need a, a, a pragmatic solution to this issue, and whether it is the government starting up a coal-powered fire station until uh, power prices drop and regulations can be cut, uh, then I don't think that that's a bad thing. But we, we can look to, say, uh, Queensland or WA, and they have uh, regulated energy industries, uh, government-run coal power uh, stations, and they don't tend to offer consumers that much of a, a 
cheaper rate. Um, obviously, nothing is bad as South Australia, but we definitely need to, to look to alternatives, uh, things such as thorium or uranium. Do we have the technology and the resources to utilise that? We have abundant amounts of it here in Australia. Do we look to, to gas? Do we look to fracking? There, there's so many things that are just held back by erroneous dogmatic uh, legislation and we, we definitely need um, to be an innovation nation and not one that's held back by this, this, uh, this greeny dogma. Uh, uh, fracking is uh, uh, certainly uh, a technology that well, certainly divides opinion uh, on the right. Um, for me, it's always come down to you know a property rights issue that you know it should be up to the farmer whether they want fracking on their property or not. But I look at the United States, for example, and the fracking revolution over there. They're basically being able to become energy independent, and uh, you know that's why we've seen uh, you know gas prices or uh, petrol prices, more specifically, just drop uh, dramatically because the. Uh, the Saudis and the uh, OPEC, they've realised they've got to compete with this and, that, and that's what's dri driven down why petrol's so cheap now. Well, it just goes to show that, um, that market competition is always better for consumers and that, you know, let's get government to run it for the people is ultimately a monopolisation that, that doesn't really act for the people, it just adds to corruption and, uh, and the like. But it's, it is a good point that you raise there, but talking about petrol prices in general, in, in general, uh, in some parts of Australia they can be as high as a as a dollar fifty a litre. But you look at what constitutes that. There's numerous taxes that go into it, so it's not only you can't only blame the petroleum companies. You also have to blame the the amount of a tax that's on fuel. Um, and then you also have to look at why there's so much tax on fuel. It's because the government's got an addiction to taxpayers' dollars because they can't control expenditure. Oh, yeah. The, once the, the government taxes something, they're, they're not going to uh, stop taxing it. I think that was uh, one of the, the Abbott government's first um, budget, budget measures was to uh, re-index the, the fuel excise. It's yeah, that's disgusting and illiberal, you know. We already have a GST, uh, and on top of that, we've got a petrol tax, and then, and then there's further rates for the local roads, and then there's further uh, state taxes to keep up the state roads. Um, so the taxation never ends. You can't escape taxation. Um, yeah, uh, I just think that that that's wrong. Uh, Peter, I believe Peter Phelps, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, a member of the Legislative Council in uh, New South Wales actually stood down because he didn't want to introduce a statewide tax on fuel, uh, but unfortunately uh, government is seeing the way to repair the budget as not cutting uh, uh, non-essential things, but instead uh, more taxation, more services, more debt. Uh, there's $20,000 worth of debt on top of every Australian's head. Um, the politicians who are in office, 60, 65, they won't have to worry about it, but it will just keep accumulating. Uh, and people looking to get uh, into the workforce now will further see more and more of their income taken away in taxation. Now, Hillary Clinton has made an unwelcome return to the public eye. She's decided to uh, write a book about why she thinks she lost the, the 2016 election, and it's titled What Happened? Um, I've seen it uh, on sale at the the, the airports. Uh, I, I've been frequently uh, 40 to $50. Uh, oh, I could think of much better things to spend my money on, but uh, she's given uh, a lot of uh, TV interviews and she doesn't think that it was her fault. She, she blames a whole bunch of other factors. Yeah, well, she does. Um, in her book she offers, uh, and across the interviews that she's been conducting, uh, she said several things which are abhorrent. She said that Trump's inaugural speech was a speech from the white supremacist gut. She also said it's time to abolish the Electoral College. 
um, why she says that. Uh, I don't know. I think the Electoral College is a great system because if we only had California and New York deciding on who was going to be the president, well, you'd essentially get a communist every time. She also said that Russia meddling uh, uh, was bigger than Watergate because it was about the future. Uh, she also said um, during the uh, debates that he used his size to intimidate me. She attacked uh, Comey for his handling of the uh, investigation. Uh, she attacked Putin uh, and she also attacked the media and along with uh, sexism and of course uh, Bernie Sanders and Jill Stein's mob taking votes away from her. Uh, that, that, so it was a blame game with Hillary Clinton. I mean, that was unbelievable that she blamed the media. I mean, the oh, uh, obviously, you know, the the alternative media wasn't on her side, but the the mainstream media they went out of their way to you know promote. Uh, her, her candidacy, you know, pa uh, paint Trump as this, you know, unhinged lunatic. I mean, uh, she, she, she's probably just disappointed that the mainstream media, they weren't effective. That, that, that's what I, what I would interpret it as. Well, I would look at, say, Alex Jones' uh, interview with um, Donald Trump. Compare how many views that gets to, say, uh, Hillary Clinton going on with Anderson Cooper. Uh, there's a lot of talk with uh, Clinton going on Anderson Cooper, but hardly the amount of views would have been generated from that as Donald Trump's interview with Alex Jones. You have to look at it now that, especially in America, uh, Info Wars or uh, you know Rebel Media has just as much sway as maybe NSNBC or a small cable station. So the landscape's changing. It's constantly uh, moving under their feet. And Clinton uh, did admit herself that maybe one of her flaws was that she was running a traditional campaign in a revolutionary climate. She wasn't maybe uh, connecting with the people. That was her one of her things that she said. But one of her comments that struck me most on the media was this. Uh, many in the, in, in the political media can't bear to face their own role in helping elect Trump from providing him free airtime to giving him uh, my emails three times more coverage than all the issues affecting people's lives combined. Now, I would have thought that it would be of general interest to the public that Hillary Clinton can't handle highly classified information uh, leaving it susceptible to being hacked. Now, I would say that that would be negligent and I would say that that would be a, a, a trait of a leader that you wouldn't want to have. Um, then she also talked about sexism. She said Americans couldn't see uh, a woman being commander-in-chief. But then I have to say, well, America had a black president for eight years, so I don't think that that close-minded and bigoted. Maybe it is Hillary that is the issue and not... Um, you know, entrenched uh, sexism. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, it's, well, I remember that uh, that you know, claiming that you know Trump's victory was you know a a victory for white supremacy. Yet he was replacing uh, a black president who'd been elected uh, twice. I mean, you know, when, when they haven't got you know any other arguments, they, they they just play you know the gender card or the or, or the race card. Yeah, well, what did, what did, do you remember what Barack Obama said that Mitt Romney would do to black people, Tim? Do you remember what he said? No, I don't, but uh, you can fill me in. He said, he will put you back in chains, you all. He said, he will put you all back in chains. That's what he said. So you're talking about using the race card, um, making a direct reference to slavery, implying that a Republican candidate would enslave 13% of the population. Now, that's just a prime example of that. And, of course, you know, the, the email, you know, scandal, like, she's making out that, you know, that was the, the only thing uh, that was wrong with her campaign. Let's not remember the, the WikiLeaks emails, which, which is, is not just the, the, the fact that... Um, 
that WikiLeaks was so easily be able to get the pedestrian emails, because remember Assange said his password was password, but yeah, what was in them was very damaging as well. I mean, the fact that, you know, the Clinton Foundation, it got all this, you know, money from all these, you know, horrible, you know, regimes uh, from the planet, it was, it was pretty much a print quo quo, you know, you donate to the Clinton Foundation, you know, when I'm president, I'll uh, do favours for you. The Clinton Foundation received $20 million to build a library from the Saudis. Um, you look at all these nefarious connections, all these donations. Uh, the, Bill Clinton, I believe, actually went to Morocco to meet with the King of Morocco, uh, a funder of the Clinton Foundation. So it was a pay-for-play scheme that they had going on, undoubtedly. Um, and she was essentially uh, renting herself out for uh, political gains for people. Um, you can just look back at her record. It's reported that she actually stole furniture outside the White House. She loots and leeches off every single uh, office that she gains for her own personal means. She went into the White House completely broke and she went out uh, having a net worth of $150 million. So I think it's very clear what that foundation was for. Um, and I think that people were interested, WikiLeaks were interested and found that that was an important part uh, to play. Uh, is this presidential candidate corrupt? You know, she was so corrupt that she was actually kicked off the Watergate Commission. So. Uh, and and she knows that she's not going to make any money off the Clinton Foundation anymore because you know, she's you know, not going to have a, another campaign, which is why uh, I'm not sure if you recall, she set up the Resist Fund to resist Trump, which basically, you know, oh, you know, we're going to campaign against Trump, but it's you know, just make sure that I continue to have an income. Well, of course, it's a bit like a, a Patreon account for whiting on Anderson Cooper. Uh, and let's not forget her uh, disastrous, uh, she, uh, uh, she helped launch that uh, Verit uh, program, which is uh, to counter all the uh, fa uh, uh, fake quotes that uh, you could publish a, a quote and uh, uh, Verit would uh, verify that it was uh, real. But of course, everyone, you know, just took the piss out of it and made like all these fake quotes with Verit on it. I hadn't heard much of that, um, uh, Tim, but certainly um, it is a worry. Uh, this this fake news phenomenon is real. Uh, we're seeing plenty of, of, of misinformation coming out of, of every outlet, from InfoWars to uh, CNN. We don't know what is real and what is fake, and I think that that's the biggest issue now. Um, the, I guess the dust resettling after the gatekeepers have left, what's going to happen? Is it going to be uh, a true free market of ideas throughout the media or, or are we going to see the same cronies back in charge? Now, a developing uh, international story is the uh, fate of the uh, Rohingya uh, Muslim people in uh, Myanmar, uh, 300,000 have uh, fled uh, from Burma into Bangladesh. Now, the reason why it's relevant to Australia is because the Greens, of, of course, you know, want to increase our refugee intake. They, um, they want us to accept 20,000 uh, Rohingya ref refugees. Now, uh, obviously, you know, the, the last thing we need uh, in Australia is is more Muslims, but uh, it's the, this conflict. It, it's important to emphasise the fact that it's the violence here is on you know many sides. The uh, Myanmar is a predominantly Buddhist country, and you know, there there has been pretty horrific uh, atrocities against the Rohingya people. I don't think the problem 
is so much um, the the Muslim population. I think it's certainly uh, if there's a big contingent group of people who are unemployed, uh, who are not very uh, intelligent, who are susceptible. It's problem with Islam is is not the whole doctrine itself. Or, Although there are problems within it, of course, um, Muhammad married a six-year-old, uh, led you know beheadings of Jews. Yes, that's all awful. Not to gloss over that, it's the it's the the Salaf the Salafist branch of belief and the Wahhab branch that is a real problem. Uh, there's definitely moderate sects, uh, and if they are um, if they are of a high IQ, if they've got some kind of the conscientious they're willing to work i think they can integrate the problem is that we've had a, a low low right group lower conscientious group of people who have settled and that's why it hasn't worked i believe that it can work uh, with with the right conditions um problem is that welfare dependency of course um with with young men and and, and, the, and the work gets him into radicalism so i don't think the problem is essentially more Muslim immigration. I think that we, we can have a slow trickle of Muslim immigration, making sure that they assimilate uh, and do as the Romans do. I don't have a problem with that. What I do have the problem with is though, is letting 20,000 in at once. I can see a lot of problems uh, starting there. I can definitely see um, enclaves, uh, get, essentially ghettos of, of you know, these refugees uh, struggling to assimilate, struggling to learn the language. Um, uh, the Greens want to accept um, 200, uh, sorry, 20,000 permanent on permanent humanitarian visas. So they're not even saying, let's wait for the pe for peace to come, let's wait for the dust to settle, but they're let's saying, let's take them on board. Uh, and I don't really think that that's a great idea. I think that maybe temporary visas um, and, and a further plan for relocation somewhere in Burma uh, wouldn't be bad. Maybe a, a, a peace um, keeping force there, uh, but just I don't really think 20,000 accepting them into Australia is a great idea at the moment. But I, of course, I do think that we we need to maybe help help out there, uh, keep the peace, but certainly. Uh, not get uh, meddling in in Burmese politics too much, or accepting twenty thousand of them. But I certainly think that there is a small role for us to play uh, on humanitarian grounds. Uh, we've already pledged five million dollars. Um, I don't see why we couldn't pledge ten on food and and medical stuff. But I certainly think that it is overstepping our uh, parameters and abilities uh, to accept in twenty thousand. Um, uh, Burmese Muslims, uh, Rohingyas at once. Well, why do they have to have to come here? That, that that's my question. I mean, a lot of them, as I mentioned before, they're fleeing into Bangladesh, which is a Muslim country. So I think what would be a better solution is to make sure that they're you know safe and secure in Bangladesh, and make sure that you know the the Bangladesh authorities can can handle it, because you know it's. Uh, the, the whole point of you know refugees is they're supposed to go to the the next safe country, which is uh, uh, Bangladesh. I think that's that's a you know mu a much better solution. If you know if Muslim people are going to migrate anywhere, it should be to Muslim countries. And of course, that was the argument with you know when we were all asked to accept Syrian refugees, people were saying, well, why isn't you know the UAE, Saudi Arabia, why aren't you know they taking in? you know, if Muslim refugees into a Muslim country. Well, what would you say if there were a military coup in Indonesia, right? And there was a massive exodus of asylum seekers or refugees or what have you coming from Indonesia. Would you say that it would be our responsibility to look after, after them being our closest neighbour? Oh, well, that's a hypothetical. So, but it, but it's always been the 
uh, accepted refugee practice that they go to their next safe country. So you know, that, that situation is different from how people have traditionally come from Australia, which is, you know, they've, they've come from places like, you know, Sri Lanka and the, and the Middle East, which is, and most, you know, people who support strong borders do, do believe that, you know, uh, refugees should be secure in the, the next country that they go to. So what you're proposing there, that's, that, that, that's a different situation to the, the, refu the refugees who have been coming here uh, re over recent times. Certainly, um, I, I would acknowledge that it was a hypothetical. I was just trying to test out the, the depth of, uh, or the breadth of your kind of um, philosophy there. But I, I certainly would agree that giving the Bangladeshi authorities the means to look after these people instead of accepting 30,000 of them would be the best way to go about things. And it's, it, it's, it's also, uh, you know, obviously, you know, the, the last thing we need is, you know, like more, uh, more Muslims here and like obviously the Greens are saying, you know, but, you know, these, you know, people that, and I accept, you know, they are uh, pay, facing persecution and atrocities, but, you know, there's, there's also plenty of, you know, horrible stories from around the world, but we've also got to, you know, ensure the security of our own citizens. And when it, when it comes to, you know, uh, you know, keeping Australia safe or making sure that, you know, people from, you know, overseas are safe, it's always got to be the Australian people first. Um, well, of course, that's, that's the, that's a key responsibility of government to keep citizens safe. I don't agree with these blanket bans on groups of people. Um, certainly, I could get on board with, say, banning people from uh, terrorism hotspots, but I, I like our means-based testing that we do at the moment because there are bad Muslims, there are bad atheists, and there, there are bad Buddhists. So I don't think that a blanket ban or the whole group of people. I take the more libertarian approach on that. I don't think we should ban a collective of people, but we should base people on their individual uh, merits, uh, on, on our points-based system. Uh, will they collect welfare or will they pay taxes? Will they be in prison or will they be a, a, a good member of the community? I don't think that a blanket ban is the best way to go about things. Certainly, um, but we have to acknowledge that there are problems and that we do need to curtail uh, fundamentalist uh, Salafist and Wahhabist teachings. Um, and I think we, we could almost, uh, it should maybe even be the role of government to say, uh, to ban um, extreme fundamentalist Wahhabi um, preachers from preaching uh, because it is just uh, poison, uh, some of this. Uh, this, some of this is just poison that's sending young uh, uh, Arabic Australian uh, men to fight. So I think that we definitely need to um, uh, to monitor whether any of these teachings are, uh, uh, you know, acting uh, in an apologetic manner to terrorism. But if they're not, um, and they're not interfering with the public peace, then I think that we should. Uh, just leave them alone, and we should respect their uh, religious liberty. Uh, well, certainly, I think we're both in agreement that the the current uh, regime, you know, uh, can't can't stand. Uh, and obviously, you know, we've, you know, we only accept. I think at this moment, thirty thousand a year. We've already accepted an extra, I believe, twenty thousand. Uh, Syrian refugees and uh, of course you know so accepting refugees another factor is that you know it's quite a strain on a strain on our budget yeah for sure but um, if you're giving men fish to eat it is highly counterproductive if we to let's say ensure a better standard of living the best ways to do that is through investment into companies that are going um, going into nations, the same through Africa and the Middle East, that are creating jobs. 
when people have got jobs, they tend to be more peaceful. Uh, but when they're in a stagnatic economic state, uh, or when they're stricken by war, that's when they they tend to um, fall uh, for such things as uh, fundamentalist Islam. So I think that the market has a big uh, place to play in it. But as as well, if you look at general statistics here, the countries that tend to be the most Christian tend to be the most peaceful. So you can't overlook the importance of Judeo-Christian values in, in ensuring you know, a peaceful and harmonious society. Um, and I think that uh, if, I think that maybe to make these people more peaceful, spreading ideas, Western values, of Judeo-Christian values, spreading the ideas of the Enlightenment, the philosophes, Jean Locke, so on and so forth, um, actually having an, a war, not against the tactic of terrorism, but a, a, a philosophical war, such as we did with the Cold War, fighting, say, um, narrow-mindedness and religious fundamentalism with, you know, meritocracy and liberal ideas, and I think that would be the way to do it. But you know, we can just look at, um, say, Iran in the 70s, women were running around in miniskirts being scientists, and now they're in a black plastic bag, essentially, from head to toe. So I think that where we're going to win is in the battle of ideas and we can look to Vietnam and say that bombing the absolute shit out of people didn't work because we didn't win their hearts over. And I think that we need to win the hearts and the minds before we can win on the battlefield. Well, Jacob, that's all we've got time for, for this week. So thank you for, for joining uh, me once again and uh, for, uh, also uh, covering the, the Australian news this week. Yeah, it was a pleasure indeed, Tim, and I can't wait to, to hear more reports out of New Zealand, and let's hope uh, Mr. English uh, wins again. All the yeah. best. Keep watching and share this with your friends. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. I'm in New Zealand for another week, so stay tuned for our New Zealand content, which will be released over the next week. Also, my trip will culminate with an election night live stream with our affiliate uh, Right Minds New Zealand, so I hope you can tune in for that. Uh, the Unshackled will still continue to cover what is happening back in Australia and, of course, uh, any international developments. Uh, don't forget also that The Unshackled is sponsoring the first ever Liberty Works in Brisbane on Saturday the 14th of October 2017, hosted by our friends at Liberty Works. You can get a 20% discount on tickets by visiting libertyfest.org.au using the coupon code LFUNSHACK, all caps. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.